Chester at all, and they go and be missionaries. And so she was a writer as well. Yes, and it was only much later when I read it for myself that I realised what she'd done. So it was a very postmodern moment because she gutted and rewritten the text, which was, which was perhaps too an example to me because I thought, well, you can do anything with yeah. language if you make it your own. Before you read us a little bit, can you just sum up the plot for us? Well, you all know the story because it's the staple of Mills and Boone, isn't it? Um, uh, really, it. It appears to uh, hinge around who will Jane Eyre marry? Um, will she marry the, the gorgeous, sexy Mr Rochester or will she give in? And will she marry the awful, pious, <laughs> milksop St John Rivers and go and uh, be a missionary, in fact? And, of course, there's the, there's the mad Bertha in the attic, Rochester's first wife, and all that burns down and Rochester goes blind because if you're going to have a sexy hero, he at least has to be a blind one. Um, <laughs> But she missed out all the bit, Mrs Winston missed out all the bit about Jane going back uh, and finding Rochester blinded and being able to accept him and, and the wife dead and all the rest of it. Um, and instead we had this, reader, I married him. A quiet wedding we had, he and I. The parson and the clerk were alone present. And when we got back from the church, I went into the kitchen of the manor house where Mary was cooking the dinner and John was cleaning the lives. And I said, Mary, I've been married to St John Rivers this morning. <laughs> 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 of course, it was meant to be Mr Rochester. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> Alistair, your next book, mm -hmm. Madame Bovary. Oh, what a choice. Gustav Flaubert. Is that a bad choice? Fantastic choice. Oh, is it all good? Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were scolding no, me. No, no. no. <laughs> I think it's quite, an, if I may say so, it's quite an unusual choice for Why? a big, beefy lad like you. Well, it, it's because two things. One, the heroine is, uh, is not very likeable. Indeed, mm -hmm. no one in it is very likeable. Mm -hmm. Tell us the story. Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually a very, very simple story. M Madame Bovary, well, there are two Madame Bovaries. It starts with Charles, who becomes her husband. Charles is this absolute sort of wimp of a man who's, a, who's the local doctor. He loses his wife and he ends up marrying the Madame Bovary of the title, uh, who's Emma, who, very, very provincial town, but she has extraordinary kind of aspirations, sort of uber-bourgeois aspirations for herself. And he just never satisfies her in any way at all and she eventually sort of edges towards having a couple of uh, what today would in the Sunday papers be called inappropriate relationships. It's really just an account of one woman and these relationships yeah. and why they develop. But I think for me it was the, the just the, the power of a very simple story beautifully told. So it had a very, very big impact on me and it's the reason why I did languages at university. It's the reason mm. why, it's probably the reason why we go to France every year for our summer holiday, it's the reason why I feel as passionate well, as it. And I probably read as much French now as I do English. And tell me, whose French was uh, better, yours or Tony Blair's? Uh, mine, by a mile. <laughs> really? Yeah. So, when you were in France with him, you could talk to Chirac and the others yeah. in their own language? Yeah, but it's wise with the French to pin them down through interpretation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Jeanette, we move on to your university days. Um, and about the same time that Alistair was going up to Cambridge, you went off to Oxford to read English. That was a pretty large achievement, getting to Oxford. It was, for me, because we didn't know anybody who had gone to university at all, let alone to Oxford or Cambridge. I, I tried to get into Oxford, and when I went for my interview, I was so frightened, and I didn't do well at all. I could hardly speak. And then... I didn't get a place, so my world collapsed at that point. And, and people were saying, well, you could go to another university. And I thought, well, no, I can't, because I want to go anywhere. So at that time, I had a little car, Hillman Imp, and I got in it, and I drove back down to Oxford uh, a year later, and I camped in a campsite, because I had no money. And I went round to see the senior tutor, and I just said, look, you have to give me a place. You don't understand. This is everything to me. Um, it's probably the longest car journey you'd ever made. Well, it only did for... Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't been, been past Blackpool, and this was part of the problem when eventually I did go to, to Oxford. Nobody told me that there were motorway service stations where you could get petrol. So I just had to fill up all these tins and have them in the back of the car and then stop on the hard shoulder because my dynamo never worked and you switch the engine off, you had to push it. So I'd have the engine running and I'd be filling up the tins of petrol and then going <laughs> onward on my journey. Um, I mean, it seems astonishing to people that, you know, this was the late 70s, but we knew knew nothing in Accrington, never been farther than Blackpool. <laughs> um, so they did give me a place which was fantastic. 
Anyway, your next book choice, this is while you're at St Catharines, yes. is Orlando by Virginia Woolf. Yeah, it's a simple story. Um, really, it begins with a young nobleman, Orlando, in, in the days of Elizabeth I, and, and he's reckless and restless um, and, and, of course, passionate and full of love. It's the story of Orlando changing gender, going across time and across sex. So it's a very audacious and bold book. In fact, the first line of it is, he, for there could be no doubt about his sex, and then we spend the rest of the book doubting his sex entirely. She's what she was so good at. So did this make you feel you could be who you really were at Oxford? Yes, it made me feel I could I could learn to be myself or begin that journey and that, that the agenda wasn't so important and that you could be a girl who's a boy who's a boy who's a girl and just not worry about it. And do you think the written word can change views? Completely. Um, you know, we are creatures of language. Human yeah. beings invented language because we have to deal with all these things, not just our outside world, our inside world, and we have to find a way of expressing that in a way which is complex. And the great thing about literature and why it's important never to dumb things down is that in a complex world, you need a complex language. Otherwise, you reduce the, the equivalent of a pair of hot and cold taps. I like it, I don't like it, I feel good, I feel bad. It's pathetic. Um, what language does is give you that range to express your world. I'm reading Virginia Woolf, this great romp, you know, this gusto, this extravagance, um, this excitement with language, I thought, that's what I want to write, like, that's how I want to be, you know, it's this world beyond the world first seen through Mrs Winterson's eyes in the Bible. Alice, your next choice is